This lesson is about social relations and how individuals relate to one another. For the first concept, I would like you to pause the PowerPoint or video and try to figure out the riddle you see on this slide. The answer is the child's mother. It is very difficult for students to figure this out because you're trying to think of a male. Would it be the grandfather? Some people say God. It, it's very difficult to think of a female as a surgeon. This is a stereotype, an exaggerated belief about a group of people. And we generally don't associate females as doctors or surgeons. So, as I said, a stereotype is an overgeneralized belief about a group of people. A stereotype can be good or bad. Like, we associate police officers with donuts. That's not a bad thing. It's just an overgeneralized belief that we have. If those beliefs turn negative, that then becomes a prejudiced attitude. If someone takes action on a negative attitude that they have, that would be considered discrimination. So, for example, an employer not hiring someone because of uh, race, ethnicity, or gender, that would be discrimination based on their negative or prejudiced attitude. We're going to look at three different theories uh, behind the cause of prejudice, what causes us to develop this prejudiced or negative attitude. Um, the first theory is the in-group bias theory. This is when we tend to favor uh, people who are in our group and share something in common with us. So we start to develop this us versus them mentality. And then we start to feel negative towards people who aren't in our group. Sometimes this can build up between different schools. You have a rivalry. You attend one school and you feel like you're superior. So you start to feel negative towards others who don't go to your school and go to your rival high school. This in-group theory and this us versus them mentality was demonstrated very well um, in an experiment that a third grade teacher in Riceville, Iowa named Jane Elliott did. We're going to call this the brown-eyed, blue-eyed experiment. After the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Mrs. Elliott wanted to try and explain to her children in her class what discrimination was all about. However, being in an all-white uh, Protestant area, uh, she didn't know how to get this idea of discrimination and prejudice across to them and, and make them experience it. So she decided that she would come in one day and she stated that all of the blue-eyed kids were superior to the brown-eyed kids. And the blue-eyed kids would get privileges throughout the day. They could get extra is at lunch. They could drink from the water fountain first. They got extra time at recess, etc. The brown-eyed kids, they were inferior. And they had to wear collars to identify them. And the superior blue-eyed kids were not allowed to hang out with the brown-eyed kids. And just within a little over an hour, the blue-eyed kids started discriminating against the brown-eyed students, you know, developing that us versus them mentality. I want you to pause the video for a minute and watch a clip from uh, Jane Elliott's brown-eyed, blue-eyed experiment. A second theory about the cause of prejudice is called the scapegoat theory. Here, people develop negative attitudes when they may be in a bad situation. They're down and out, and they need someone to blame. For example, sometimes you often hear people complaining about immigrants taking, taking American jobs. So people without jobs who are suffering, that is their scapegoat, the immigrants coming in. Um, these pictures are from the Holocaust that took place in Germany, and that's another example of scapegoat. After World War I, the Germans were held responsible 
they had to pay huge reparations. And therefore, the German people were very poor. And <coughs> you know, many of them malnourished and out of work. However, the Jewish population tended uh, to still prosper. They were still thriving and had businesses. And since the German people were so desolate and in such bad shape, they started to develop this negative, prejudiced attitude towards the Jewish population as their scapegoat. A third theory behind the cause of prejudice is called the just world phenomenon. This is the fact that people blame a victim. We don't like to think about people being vulnerable, so sometimes we say, oh, the person who received this negative action uh, put themselves in that place, and they got what they deserve. That helps us justify bad things happening. Um, to a victim. So if somebody is walking down the street at 3 o'clock in the morning in a dimly lit area and they get mugged or attacked, we might say, well, they shouldn't have been there. That was a bad decision on their part and they got what they deserved. So the world is just. So altruism is doing something good for someone uh, regarding uh, providing some unselfish act to help someone. There are three theories behind why we do these unselfish acts uh, of altruism. First of all is an evolutionary perspective, stating that we worked together way back in caveman times because it was more beneficial to us as communities to survive. If you were out on your own, then you might not be that successful. So working together and doing good deeds for one another was actually uh, beneficial for the whole group. So that trait kind of evolved in us. Um, the second social responsibility norm. This is the idea that we are very helpful and, and do good things for those who we feel are dependent upon us, may need our help, and we are responsible for. So if you are walking in a and walking into a building, you may uh, stop and wait for someone across the parking lot if they uh, need assistance, let's say they're on crutches or something like that, as opposed to someone who does not look dependent and helpless. Uh, the social exchange theory is interesting. Uh, this is saying we do good things to maximize our own benefits, so there really is no good deeds. Everything we do is for others. Even if it seems like it's unselfish, it's actually to help us. So for example, one might say, you give a homeless person that you see money or food. It's not that you just want to do a good deed, but you looked at them, that made you sad. So if you give them something, it makes you feel better. So you're doing it to benefit yourself. So the frustration aggression principle. This would state that you're more likely to be aggressive if you're frustrated. So if you're angry at your father for grounding you for some reason, you may take action by doing something to his car. If you are playing basketball and you're at an away school, and you lose the game by two points and you're so frustrated, you would be more likely to take an aggressive action and say trashing their locker room after the game. And the last thing we're going to look at are the five factors of attraction. So five reasons that we feel attraction to one another. The first factor is proximity. We tend to be more fond of people and start to like others who we see on a regular basis. So that's proximity. People were always around. And that's one reason why long distance relationships usually fail. Um, the mere exposure effect falls under here. So the more we're around someone, the more we tend to like them, the more we're exposed to others. But this also can apply to like goods. The more you see an advertisement for a particular food, 
you start to become more fond of it and you may go to the market and you have all these different varieties but the one that you've been exposed to over and over and over again on television may be the one you purchase. Similarity is the second factor of attraction. We tend to be more attracted to people that we have things in common with. We would prefer to date someone that we like the same, we have the same interests. It would be very difficult to have a relationship with someone and we have nothing in common with them. So the third factor of attraction is reciprocal liking. If we know someone likes us and is fond of us, we're more likely to reciprocate and like them as well, uh, which makes sense. This eliminates that fear of rejection, going out on the limb if you like someone and you're not sure their feelings. The fourth factor of attraction involves conditioning, classical conditioning, making some association with someone that you like. For example, if someone every day walks in and brings you something you like, let's say chocolate. You love chocolate, so this person comes in every day and gives you a piece of chocolate. You will begin to associate that person with that good feeling you get when they give you the chocolate and in return you will start to like them. And finally the last factor of attraction is just physical attraction. Just uh, being attracted to someone because you like how they look. <laughs>